Good day everyone, Doc Mika here and this is the last uh, lecture video, I guess, uh, for this subject, all right? I wanted to make more, I wanted to discuss more, but apparently we do not have enough time anymore, all right? So uh, in this uh, lecture video, I will be discussing two husbandry procedures, all right? And you will have two um take home i guess reading assignments if you could call them that about uh cesarean section uh and equine castration but for now for this lecture video we will be discussing uh dehorning and disbudding and castration being the two most common procedures done in the farm uh animal setting all right so it is uh it is of no explanation, I guess, needed that we are simply going to talk about uh, small and large uh, ruminants for this uh, for this lecture. And these uh, like sheep, um, goats, um, bulls, right? They would have uh, these horns, but the recent, or not recent, the current setting right now is the institution of bald genetics right because of the risks because of the costs because of um and all those trouble that could happen um with horned animals in a farm setting could be commercial or backyard ang prefer na ngayon na going management for horns right would be uh genetics all right, and we'll discuss that more in a bit. But for now, we'll discuss uh, dehorning and disbudding. I know you are no strangers to these uh, uh, to these procedures. You know the difference of such. So I'll be focusing on the methods mainly later. Right? Why do we want to dehorn or uh, remove the horns or stop the horns from even growing to begin with uh, for our animals? All right, number one, and this is the primary indication for it, would be to reduce the risk of injury, number one, to the animal itself, especially when the horns have the tendency to curve inward and cause a traumatic uh, puncture injury to the lateral aspect of the face of the animal. Right? That is one direction it could curve. It could also curve uh, lateral caudally and it could hit the neck. Right? Number two, it could reduce the risk of injury to the other animals. And I'm not just talking about the animals that of the same species, of, for example, a goat. It could also be other animals that is being kept in a farm, like dogs, um, you know, the herding dogs. And of course, prevent or reduce the risk of injury to the personnel. And the personnel handling them. Uh, would be farm workers, us veterinarians, and auctioneers when these animals are being sold or auctioned off, right? Uh, number uh, second indication would be with a reduction of the risk of injury would also will also enable us to efficiently and safely transport them to certain facilities, right? Number one would be slaughter facilities with uh, dehorned animals or with bald animals, you would also require less space, right? And with, uh, in some areas and in some countries, you could gain a price advantage um, as com uh, with dehorned and bald animals as compared to horned because they would have a higher market price, all right? With uh, the absence of horns, you would also reduce the bruising of carcasses in, uh, in, slaughter, uh, in slaughter areas. And that would increase the market value. Ayo bumili ng mga tao na nakikita nila na ang muscles or ang skin ng uh, hayop ay damaged or dramatically, uh, uh, what they call this, injured. Kumbaga. Right? With the horning and disbudding, you would also produce docile cattle, which are easier and safer to handle, and they would be less aggressive, which is usually seen that kind of behavior during feeding or during mating season, right? And with all these risks um, decreased, you would have uh, safer and easier use 
of your handling facilities. Your farm workers will be trained not to um, get scared of uh, such animals. You would be able to handle animals with less restraint because they're now docile. Okay? Now, dehorning or cornuectomy is the removal of the horns. It could be a part of the horn or it could be the entire horn, including the bud and uh, the skin on the base of the horn. Usually, we also remove around one-fourth to one-eighth centimeter of uh, skin margin around the horn base. And dehorning is usually an elective procedure, but it becomes therapeutic in nature when you uh, use this procedure for uh, cattle with fractured horns, could be a result of a traumatic injury, or those diagnosed with osteomyelitis. Right? Uh, a little anatomy in fish, uh, horns begin as horn buds, right? And this could be easily palpated in our animals, okay? So when you restart your clinical duties and you see lambs or kids and calves, try to feel for the horn bud if this is a newborn animal or if the farm's uh, management system is not employing any dehorning or disbudding procedures. You could feel for this one. It would be in the craniolateral aspect of the head, right? And the horn buds are not, um, basically, they're not originally attached to the skull, okay, when they're newborn. But uh, after two months, right, usually eight weeks, um, the corneal process, okay, and you could actually see that if you remember your anatomy with a skull when you're studying the skull of the animal, okay, there's a corneal process of the frontal bone that continues to grow outward, right, until for two months, it will continue to grow outward until it connects with the horn bud. And beneath the corneal process is the frontal sinus, okay? That's where the nerves, the blood vessels are right? for the head. Any sinus, any space that's in uh, within, the horse, uh, within the skull, okay? That's why you have a maxillary sinus, you have a mandibular sinus, you have the orbital sinus. Ito yung mga spaces inside that there, that's usually well vascularized and well supported by nerves, right? So this frontal sinus will open into the horn at four to six months of age. And that is why when we have a fully uh, grown horn, yung malalaki na yung horn nila, when you cut it, you would uh, expect hemorrhage when we do that. Because para yung koko, okay? As the horn grows, as the horns uh, grow longer uh, out, outward of the body, outward of the skull, uh, it is continued. Uh, nagko continue doon yung blood and nerve supply. Okay? For the horn, the blood supply, the vascular supply is uh, given up by the corneal artery, which is a branch of the superficial temporal artery. Right? And the uh, nerve supply would be the corneal nerve, which is the branch of the zygomatico temporal nerve. Alright? And this, uh, these structures follow the van. You know, remember the van uh, configuration in anatomy, vein artery nerve? It follows that way. And it, they would usually course caudally from the orbit, okay, from the eye, okay, to the horn. All right? So that's where uh, you, will see, uh, you will see them. Not really. <laughs> but you could palpate for the coronal nerve for some, okay, especially if the animal's big. Okay, and I hope you still remember how we do the corneal nerve blocks because that is important when you do the horning or even this budding, right? Now, the methods on how we dehorn, right? There are four mainly, chemical, thermal, cutting, and genetic. And since you have a genetic, uh, <laughs> gen animal genetic subject, which honestly, I... Oh, when I was in college, I, I was not fond of it because it, it's composed of a... It was hard, you know, let, let's make it short. It was hard <laughs> back then. <laughs> I, I, if I hated para, I think I hated genetics the same way. <laughs> it was harder because the professor was so good. So, yeah. So I'll leave that for that subject, okay? To discuss the genetics, you know, the autosomal dominal, uh, dominant trait, why some, uh, what do you call this? Bald Hereford, Angus, some Jersey breeds, you know, all of that genetics na bahala, okay? 
I'll focus on the chemical, thermal, and cutting methods. Right? The chemical and thermal are included in the disbudding. Uh, we call this process. Okay? Disbudding is uh, the removal or destruction of the horn-producing corium or part of the skin in young ruminants. So, um, yung chemical and thermal methods of dehorning are pertaining to actually the processes of disbudding. Because when you look at the book, disbudding is under dehorning because you're removing the horn buds. Okay? They're not, uh, basically, hindi yan magkaiba sa libro. Dehorning, disbudding, disbudding is under dehorning. Okay? So, when do we do this? Right? Um, there's a little difference in calves and small ruminants. In calves, you have a basically a wide birth for you. It's uh, You just have to do it prior to six weeks of age. Uh, for small ruminants, you could do it in the first 24 hours of life and prior to two weeks of life Okay, for small ruminants. And in some operations, especially those commercial operations for beef, um, you do it the earliest the management system allows. Okay. And the horning, this budding, uh, depending on the situation, usually this budding, you don't need a veterinarian for it for big farms. Um, yeah, because the, the process is fairly easy and usually they delegate it to the farm caretakers, farm workers. Okay? Uh, the veterinarian is actually called uh, in certain cases na malalaki yung horns, you need to administer local anesthetic or nerve blocks, or you're going to do a cosmetic kind of dehorning. Okay? So, after six weeks, the horn bud begins to attach to the skull. Okay? Uh, the restraint... Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking at two screens. I'm sorry. All right. Restraint methods. We have to restrain them while we're doing this. Okay? Especially for um, these animals. Nambawa, maliliit. Uh, like the young of the small ruminants. Cubs. You don't really go for GA for such... Um, procedures because they're fast and you could do well with local anesthetic naman okay but you have to, uh, since you're not anesthetizing them general anesthetizing them uh, you have to utilize certain restraint methods to minimize number one the stress to anxiety and the risk of injury to the animal and to you right and there are two main restraint methods okay you have the chemical which is you know a sedation for uh, anxiolysis, better handling, hindi siya magfa-fight, which you expect. Okay? And uh, it is sometimes combined with local anesthetics. Right? And chemical is also combined with physical restraint methods. Placing the animals in a squeeze chute, a tilt table, calf cart, or halters. Basically, ang calf cart is like a squeeze chute, pero may wheels siya sa baba. Okay? <laughs> Right? The tilt table, I, I, I hope you remember that uh, pre, uh, lecture we had, yung ilalagay mo siya sa parang squeeze shoot, pero na to turn yung squeeze shoot so that you could actually do hoof care for such animals. And for some who don't have uh, these kinds of physical restraint uh, equipment, you could simply use halters, okay? Or manual restraint with your arms, like the one in the picture below, okay? Now, the methods for this budding would be chemical or thermal. Okay, number one would be the caustic paste. And the second one has a lot of names. Could be hot iron, cautery, or thermal this budding. Okay? Now, uh, going back to uh, the anesthesia for it. Okay? Uh, the use of lidocaine, again, as a reminder for your goats and for young ruminants, you have to... Make sure, let me see my notes. Yeah, uh, usually lidocaine is in 2%. Uh, I'm dredging my memory. Okay, you have, if you're going to use local anesthetic for your uh, young ruminants, you have to dilute your lidocaine to uh, from 2% to 1% or 0.5%. Uh, usually that would do. Uh, how do you dilute that? I'm not going to go into math. My brain is tired. Um, but yeah, basically just half it. Uh, what else? What else? You have to expect um, with the availability of anesthetics in the Philippines, kaya yan madalas hindi na gumagamit ng local anesthetic. Um, usually, 
um, mild sedation could also be uh, be done with silent butorphanol, but again, low dose. Okay, is around 0 0.02 mg per keg. Uh, yeah, for uh, for sila. Okay. Now, how do we do this? Uh, caustic uh, paste application. Oh, this is the example of the restrained methods. Okay, you have the squeeze shoot, which keeps the head in there. Uh, halter scaf cart. Okay, so cute. Oh, I, I just find it so cute. <laughs> All right. So you have to properly restrain the animal's head. Um, you have to, oh, these are just some of the equipment you need. You need a clipper. You need sterile gloves. Uh, basically, you need gloves when you handle caustic paste. Okay. The, the idea of the caustic paste is that it will burn that area. Okay. And if it can burn the skin of the, uh, burn the, the skin of the animal enough, for the horns not to, you know, not to grow, it could burn you, okay? So you have to locate the horn buds, you clip that area. Some would actually use uh, a marker to outline where the horn buds are, okay? And then, since because of this, uh, not really toxic, uh, what term am I looking for? Yeah, the burn risk for, uh, chemical burn risk for uh, caustic paste, uh, some would use a mild balm around the area, not on the area, ha, around the area of the of the horn bud. Since kapag na hit yon ng caustic paste, magpopok nat yon yung hair, hindi na siya grow because the hair follicles are also dead. Okay? So, uh, with gloved hands, you have to apply the caustic paste to the horn buds. You could use a Q tip, like a sturdy big uh, Q tip, to accurately place the caustic paste within the marker right and the thing is the caustic paste will just dry in 24 hours right so i'll discuss this more in a bit let's just see first how it's done okay i don't know
You already shaved it earlier, you could see it. Um, there's uh, sorry for suddenly speaking. <laughs> um, I have I have googled some bomb for it, and one just said Vaseline would do. There's one that is uh, specific for this use. Uh, I forgot the brand, but you could find it in Google. You could put it dehorning bomb goats sheep. Yeah, you could put it there. Google everything. Um, specific shop for this reason, but for some, I saw that Vaseline is good already. Okay. So this one is only restrained by manual restraint and halters. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Ginawa siyang parang dog, meron siyang leash. Okay. Windy. Caustic face. Uh, oh, she's using a popsicle stick. That would do as well. Apply it. So you have to be very careful when you do, when you do that. And um, animal welfare concerns for this budding and dehorning is quite a issue, especially for some countries like Australia, and New Zealand. So ang ina employ na talaga nilang way to prevent horns would be uh, genetics um, because this is painful uh, yeah basically the, the pain of the animal is uh, sad and uh, real and cannot be uh, taken for granted for in some countries animal welfare groups they are very strong which is good Now this one you could since it takes 24 hours to dry okay some would cover the, this with duct tape oh, yeah. yeah duct tape huh? <laughs> or uh vet wrap okay you're done so cute yep all right Now, um, for some, they said that you can only use bef uh, caustic paste in calves before they are two days old for certain reasons like they tend to scratch their heads against something which would rub the paste off and you think it's disbudded, but then you see horns appearing after a few months. And they said that uh, calves by two days old or like uh, three days old can now stand better on uh, three legs and can support themselves better and will enable them to scratch their heads and or oh yeah scratch their heads with another calf or smear the paste to the walls or to the posts because again this is painful the uh this will trouble them and that will cause them to to move around okay now since this is uh, remains wet for around 24 hours you have to prevent the animal getting wet for at least 24 hours and what is the usual cause of getting wet for these animals it's rain okay so uh, why do you have to keep it there 
Okay? When the rain falls on the paste, it will bring the paste down to the eyes because that's the nearest one. <laughs> okay? Basic gravity. And that could get into the eye and the caustic paste can actually cause blindness to the calf. Right? So you have to be very careful. Uh, some uh, some uh, farms and some universities have found that um, doing this procedure just before feeding the calves with a bottle, which that's what you usually do, okay? Uh, you, you, uh, the, the milk replacers that you have, okay? Especially for dairy calves, uh, the colostrum is uh, straight from the mom. However, the milk that the calves would drink would be milk replacers because the dairy cows are getting milked for the business, right? They're not going to give that to the calves, okay? So what they, uh, what they found was that uh, they did a study in 2011 is that um, um, paste application, we know that it causes stinging or burning sensation. But when calves are fed immediately after placing the caustic paste, this will distract them. Okay? Because they have something to do, they're, they're hungry, they're gonna look for the ano, they're gonna look for the bottle. And also, in a separate study, um, it was found that sugar in the milk helps reduce pain uh, and lower the heart rate. Okay? And also, this is true for babies, human babies. Okay? That's why they stop crying when you feed them milk. Okay? All right. So, uh, so, oh, I already said this one. Okay? Now, hot iron or cautery or thermal disbudding. This is the uh, utilization of a heated metal bar, which could be heated through open flame or electrically, okay, to burn the calf horn bud tissue. It's just basic uh, real burn or a chemical burn, okay? And you, uh, you heat the metal bar to 600 degrees Celsius, okay? So what do you actually burn? You burn and destroy the epidermal and dermal skin layers and include the subcutaneous tissue of the burn site, and since you are uh, burning a part of the normal skin of the animal, that can cause tissue damage and edema around the burn, which is one of the complications for it. Okay? What is the advantage of thermal disbudding? Okay? There is low risk of incomplete disbudding, which is usually correlated with caustic paste. Okay? It can be performed for calves up to six weeks of age. And housing and weather do not uh, impact efficacy. Okay? Doesn't matter if no na nyan, doesn't matter if it is uh, housed with uh, four more calves, right? Uh, because there's no paste that will be smeared off. In caustic paste, kasi, I forgot to say, you usually house the calves individually uh, for the first 24 hours para ma prevent na mag rub off yung caustic paste to each other. And some farms would not have the facility to house them individually because calves are usually housed together. So, um, with hot iron disbudding, you could, you know, um, it doesn't matter. Disadvantages, yes, it would require more labor and restraint. Um, it would require more technical knowledge for your workers in the use of equipment and proper restraint as well. Uh, and uh, since they have recommended, okay, I'm going to say recommended, <laughs> that uh, you use local anesthetics or sedation for this. Um, there is a withholding of meat due to the drug use. Now, in Europe, this is the most used method of this budding. And in Finland, this is the only legal method of this budding. The caustic paste is not accepted. Now, how to do this? Quite easy. You properly restrain, you locate the horn buds, you clip the hair, and while you're doing all this and uh, uh, while you're doing a nerve block, okay, you preheat the metal bar already. And you have to pick the metal bar okay, with a diameter just a little bit larger than the horn bud. Okay? Not too big, but also not too small. Na sakto ka lang. Because again, you have to cut off a certain diameter of the skin margin at the base of the horn. Because that's where the horn producing cells are. Okay? Uh, if you're going to use lidocaine as a four-day meat withhold, um, it's usually very advantageous to reduce pain and discomfort even post-operatively. 
and how do you do use uh, how do you use the desbudding device again it could be just a metal bar na heat with open flame or an electrical one you place it on top of the horn bud you apply pressure and you rotate back and forth for uh quite uh um the range is quite uh long 5 to 20 seconds usually based on the size of the animal and you will just notice that the horn bud or button will slow off in four to six weeks okay now the use of NSAIDs for uh, in addition to local anesthesia and also to reduce the inflammation and, and associated pain after this budding is uh is recommended and what's the usual NSAID so usually it's metaca meloxica okay you could give it orally for these patients. Some would use flunixin for it. It's just that flunixin can only be given IV, right? It cannot be given IM or SC. So um, usually it's just a veterinarian who gives this. Um, yeah, <laughs> All right. I think those, those are just some examples off the top of my head. Right, other ways of dehorning. Cutting dehorning, right? Cutting, basically just, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is the main action for it, cutting. One way, uh, one instrument that they use would be the tube spoon or tube dehorner. Don't be confused by uh, uh, later because the other one is named scoop, but this one is scooping. I'll discuss, wait. <laughs> All right, tube spoon or tube dehorner can be used in calves of two months of age or younger. Uh, the, cutting e the, the cutting edge which is the bottom one, okay? Bottom. It's placed around the base of the horn, and then you push it, you put pressure onto the, the button, and then you curve the tube spoon toward the jaw, and then you twist it upward to scoop it out, to scoop the horn bud out, okay? And you would expect, yes, the risk for this one is hemorrhage, which they have said can be managed with direct pressure. Or if you see the artery, because it's usually a, an arterial bleed, and pumipitik-pitik <laughs> yan. Okay, yan. Right? You could actually get hemostatic forceps, get the artery, and then pull it out. Okay? What it does is that it cuts the artery at the level of where the artery is inside uh, the head. And it could just clot by itself. Okay, I'm not sure why you have to pull it out because I haven't seen that, but that's what the books say. Okay, next one would be scoop the horners or Barnes the horner. Again, this is why I don't want you to get confused by the tube spoon and the scoop the horner. Um, it is used in calves uh, way older, three months of age or one year or more, or once the horns have erupted and the horn base fits the end of the scoop the horner okay so what you do is you place this end uh, sorry yeah the end the circular end there on the around the base of the horn and then you pull apart the handles and that will make an elliptical cut we'll have a video in a bit all right um now uh, for some they don't like the scoop the horners because the handles that you see there parang tongs are quite long <laughs> and usually they don't have a space for it but if you have space, you know, this is the one of the equipment that is still used you know, in a lot of countries. Um, the corneal arteries would be exposed and you could address them in a certain way. Okay? In the same way. All right, let's see. I don't know what, if you could. Let's look at the dehorners first. It's almost like a post hole digger, like a small post hole digger. And it goes in there and just gets the horn and down into the root because if you don't, they can regrow down into the skull so let's get her and there is the remnant <coughs> Oh, God. 
I don't like this at all. I don't think they even gave any analgesia or anesthesia for this animal. I hope that's not rust that I'm seeing. and down into the root, because if you don't, they can regrow down into the skull. So, get her. Oh, God. Oh, God. Yep. Is the remnant. <sighs> oh, this is hard to watch. Oh, there's another one. I will not subscribe. <laughs> but it is how they do it. Ooh, that's fast. Oh, that's fast. Oh, my calf. Oh, my gosh. Well, um, they had an explanation about it <laughs> in the video. This is on YouTube. They had an explanation that this calf was okay after 15 minutes and it was back to grazing. Okay, but still, you know, it's so painful, right? So, yeah, that's how you use the scoop de horner. Next, uh, keystone or gillipin. Okay, basically, you have blades here that will just cut the horn. Okay, this is used for larger horns. Uh, you place the blades firmly at the base of the horn and you just cut, right? Uh, yeah, it's like giant shears, okay? Um, then you have electri eh? electrically powered dehorning saws. Basically like, uh, yeah, the one you use for like wood and a sort, right? So the cutting process is of course quicker. Um, again, you are not removing the entire horn, just a part of it. Um, but it has been found that some who are not familiar with the anatomy or very ajit when they use the dehorning saw can cause the removal of the ear because that's the usual trajectory of your blade. Especially if you think that the horn is so tough, you're putting so much pressure on the horn and then it gives way. Your saw would move caudally and that would cause the cutting of the ear, right? So before you use this, you have to make sure you actually know, okay? Now, what we what you saw, and I don't know what lecture was that, instruments, I guess, is the use of obstetrical wire or fetotomy wire uh, connected to handles like those, and you do the alternate movement, the para kang naglalagare, okay? And they found that hemorrhage with this is usually less since the cut that you're making is so jagged as compared to the dehorning saw, right? So what else? What else? What else? Yeah. Okay, uh, videos, I don't know which one will play first, man. <laughs> okay, sorry. This one um, had the horn curved uh, ventrocranially and uh, punctured the cheek of the ca calf, cow, bull, I'm not sure, <laughs> of the animal, <laughs> right? And yeah, so they cut on that area. This is uh, one... Uh, one example of this. Oh. How about that? that? Can you get it in there? That's a good half inch deep. The electrically powered salt. Do you want to videotape? <laughs> it's like really, really. Is not fun. Your brain? Come on, Trisha. Oh, she's almost there. Just the Keep skin. Going. Go for it, Trisha. Okay. Woo! Now, <laughs> we'll cover through. And I'm. And 
Yeah, that's the part of the horn that punctured the cheek. How about that? Can you get it in there? It's a good half inch deep. Ooh. Yep. So you're gonna have to manage that with you know normal wound management fl uh, to prevent any flies from getting in there and infecting it. Okay, and do you saw this? Um, I'm gonna mute it. <laughs> you saw this video earlier uh, in the instruments lecture. So that's how you use the obstetrical wire or the fetotomy wire. All right. So while you're watching that, another way to dehorn is uh, what you call cosmetic dehorning. Okay, this is actual GA going into a surgical suite, put uh, putting uh, surgical drapes on that area, and this is done. If um, that's why it's cosmetic, because your goal is not just to remove the horn, but also to create a more predictably uh, desirable looking head after dehorning, right? Um, it's usually. Uh, of course, it would take more time. It would take more labor. Um, uh, it's more expensive. And you have sterile technique to manage. Uh, but um, why is it done for some? Because they said that cattle, which are cosmetically dehorned, are way, uh, cost way high in the market. Uh, live market value, okay? Yung, uh, if the, the, the cow, the bull, or the, mm, yeah, the animal is cosmetically dehorned, it's, uh, it would have a high, higher price than those dehorned with normal uh, procedures, right? So it's just basically, you're gonna cut around, uh, you're gonna cut around here, right you're gonna cut uh and then you're going to remove the horn including the horn bud you have to remove the attack castration hmm. all right so again one of the most common things to do <laughs> um in the large animal surgery uh laboratory i guess i think you're gonna you're gonna be doing castration of goats which is cool I don't know when's that gonna happen, but we will see. Uh, I, I'm not gonna vent about it anymore. I think it's just uh, for some for some universities, I guess they start they just um, hindi na nila nila hindi na nila ginawang balikan na lang natin yung laboratory later. What they did was they just removed the laboratory part and. Oh, their ter the term was tinanggap na namin na yung mga estudyante na nag-aaral ngayon would be deficient in the laboratory part. But what they said was delaying the the education for you to like go back to school and then have like uh, I don't know 15 units of laboratory. They said is quite uh, it's not inhumane. <laughs> they didn't agree with inhumane, but it's just not practical. Because you're not gonna do the laboratory while you're learning it in the lecture. So you probably forgot about it already. But I do hope that when they start again, uh, you know, uh, pulling you into class, you still have that inertia for, uh, for this industry. Because I understand if it's gone now, you know, I would be. <laughs> Mine would be gone because <laughs> I'd be working already. But, you know, I, I admire each one of you for pushing through. I, what, from what I hear, I'm not sure. From what I hear, you're still going to do online classes next semester. <laughs> I don't know what the, is that going to happen, but I'm not going to be there for it. So, yeah, because I can see it now. I, I can see... And yeah, you're staring at the screen while I'm venting. I'm staring at the screen too while I'm venting. Um, uh, it's it's um, it's between a, a a rock and a hard place. You know, you're gonna delay your education. Uh, you're gonna get delayed to graduate. But then, what are you gonna do when you graduate? You know. So what I and right now I feel so. What they call this? Whatever, however good I make a lecture video, which 
is dictated by my mood because <laughs> I get so frustrated by things. Um, uh, even if I make this, you know, uh, really well, I know that it's not the same. And it's like the efforts are just wasted. You know, I know it's not, but it, that's just the feeling. That's why maybe I felt uh, reluctant to just make more videos because I can see, I can, I can feel it. I can feel uh, what the students go through at the other side of the screen. I can feel what you are thinking while you're, while you're watching it. And I don't want you to worry anymore about like grades and stuff. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to do for you, for the students, for the teachers and those who are supposed to be doing their jobs or not, you know, they're getting paid to pretend they're doing something. And that's all they care about because they get paid. Yeah, we're, we have reached that level of humanity. No, we don't care anymore. Manhead, I'm not saying manhead, we have a lot of feelings. We just don't want to target or we don't want to project those feelings to certain people, you know. It's not, it's not worth it, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> I know I'm venting for like four minutes. I'm sorry. I apologize, you know. I can't, I can't speak uh, the same way and to the same people that I usually vent to. I, I talk to some, but not always. Hindi naman yan lagi parang, hmm, besh, sesh tayo sa labas. Parang, yung ganun lang kabilis and then you could vent but now it's it's like all this all this lecturing all this recording are useless you know that's what I feel and no money can say that it's useful and no you know it's 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 like you're forcing so much <laughs> for too many people and all we could do is wait for when we go back to normal uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe the the idea for a teacher is that you're the optimistic one and you're the hopeful one. You know, guys, just keep strong. Just you know, you know, keep working. You know, just set your priorities straight. And all here, all I'm hearing is for what? Hmm? For what? I do, I do, I do, I do good. But then, what's the what's the end game? Wala de ba? So, you know, understand my frustration. Oh, well, castration. <laughs> oh, well, for those who, for those who actually, uh, um, what do you call this, fast forward <laughs> the, the, the lecture, because, oh, God, she's venting again. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, this is the start of the lecture. Okay. This is my last lecture. I have a, I have, I think I have a review for the, I don't know if they're graduating. <laughs> Uh, for the for the some students tomorrow for the surgery i don't even know what i'm gonna teach but hey this is my last lecture yeah. hi i know at least i, I don't want to want to do this anymore guys i don't want to do this anymore okay why do we castrate okay the other term for registration is orchiectomy mainly to reduce aggressiveness and when we reduce the aggression, they can be easily and safely handled. Okay. And, uh, hmm. and <laughs> castration tends to improve uh, meat quality. Right? The methods. There are a lot of methods. Okay. You have the surgical and the bloodless. For surgical uh, way of castrating, okay, uh, this is basically the same way as like how we do dogs and cats. Right? Surgical. It's just a matter of approach. We have the lateral approach and the distal approach. Okay? And the bloodless, I think you, you have an idea already. You have the illustrator or, or bands. Uh, we have the bordizo, emasculatum, or the hormonal. Okay? With a hormonal, and they call it, um, yeah, you do a pharmacological castration, which is actually done in some cats. You know, because for some owners, they want to reduce certain parts of the of the male behavior, but they don't want it totally gone. So some would just do chemical castration. Okay, when do we do it? For lambs and kids, it's usually done in the first week of age. Um, and for some, if they are to be kept long term, 
like pets, you know, they're they're not like a farm setting. Uh, you could uh, recommend for them to wait at least five to six months to allow the growth of the penis and urethra. And for that to happen, the, the, the penile adhesion should be detached. And that happens usually in five to six months. Okay? So in calves, there is a um, question or a debate, basically, of what to, uh, of when to castrate them. Is it, do you wait for them to be, uh, do you castrate them while they're young? Okay? Or do you wait for them to get old a little bit? Okay, uh, why? Why is that? Uh, for the young, okay, it has been found with newborns. There's an easier technique. You you don't need as much restraint, and there's less animal welfare concerns because um, operating on any older animal, uh, older bull, uh, older, uh, you know, oh no, not a steer. Oh yeah, older horse. You know, uh, the the risk for post-op complications would be higher. The restraint that you need would be higher. The the risk for of injury for personnel is also higher and for the animal as well. So and also the pain, uh, they say, is actually of a higher degree, because number one, the balls would be way bigger, right? And also uh, that's why usually for some calves they are castrated young. Okay, um, for some they prefer to castrate beef cattle. A little bit older, okay? Because they said that when you castrate the calf, the live weight gain decreases. Hindi sila hindi maganda yung katawan nila for uh, beef and slaughter standard, okay? So for some, again, the, the the exact age of when calves are castrated would vary, and it would depend on the owner's expectation, the facilities, and the intended use of the animal. For some, they would still castrate as newborn, but to address the decrease in live weight gain, they would use hormonal implants after castration to maintain the weight gain. Okay? We usually, well, when uh, the testosterone secretion would usually commence between three Three and a half, five and a half months. So usually overlap that, and then uh, once you see, or if you're, if it's due for slaughter or such, then you could do the uh, what do you call this? Yeah, it's just a balance of when you castrate or or what is more important to you, the quality of the beef or how docile and how easy to handle your animals are. Okay. Number one method would be open castration. Uh, this is the surgical one. And we'll start with uh, the distal approach. Okay, This method is usually the one done for animals less than 150 kilos. And this is what's usually done in small ruminants. However, I am not sure what you're going to do for your clinics. I've seen some who did it like a dog, but a scrotal approach. Okay. Uh, but this is uh, the distal approach would be you know different just a bit. Uh, you know how they restrain the lambs and the kids. Yung para nilang pinap pinapatihaya, okay? Pinapatihaya nila or like in a semi dorsal recumbency position. Dahil parang nakatihaya pero nakatayo yung uh, they call this cranial part of the body nakasandal dun sa tao. You can do that, or you know you could just uh, restrain them as dorsal dorsal recumbency. You clip the area, you aseptically prep it, and then what you do is you pull, grasp, and pull the distal portion of the scrotum distally. Okay, you pull it. This is the end of the scrotum. Okay, the balls. Uh, sorry. Oh, I don't have. Okay, this is the distal end of the scrotum. Okay, so the bo the balls, <laughs> the testicles would be displaced proximally here. Okay. So you cut this entire thing off. Right? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> okay? And that will expose the testis. Now, surgical castration. Surgical castration, what we mean by that is that we open it and then we remove completely the testicles. Okay? And this is the most certain method of castration because you're removing them. So there's no question if there's still a remnant of the, of the testis 
that could be producing testosterone there's no uh there's no question because you removed it okay so after that uh, exposing th this is the incision basically you know okay right so you do it the same way like a cat okay you pull this one each one you free it from the vaginal tunic if you like separate the you know the contents of the spermatic cord uh then you have to legate those as well you know same thing okay you just expect that this one is bigger right and legate and then cut right or for some what they do is that um after they see the cord okay after they i don't know why but after they see the cord they just emasculate it or they clamp it for a bit okay for a certain time period they clamp it but and then just let the testis slow off however you're already there <laughs> then just cut it off diba? so i don't know why <laughs> if someone can educate me please do but again i don't understand farm animals <laughs> all right uh la, 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 la. what else okay yeah next would be lateral approach this is what we call the newberry knife method this is the newberry knife okay and believe it believe it or not when i looked at the sample questions for the navle the, there is a question about the newberry knife which is like oh okay uh, yeah th that's the licensure exam here and when i looked at the sample questions i was like there's a new berry knife i was like did, where did i hear about that nowhere until i made this lecture i'm like oh new berry knife anyway see you know it's a, it's a blank slate once again for me okay um for lateral approach you do not need to put them in dorsal recumbency or ventral recumbency you just you can do this with a standing sedation or while they're in a shoot what you do is that you pull the testicle distally naman. Okay? You pull, not the scrotum ha. You push the testicle distally. Okay? The testis itself. And then you make a vertical incision on the lateral wall of the scrotum over the testicle. Okay? Scalpel and the other side, scalpel as well. So that will result, right? That will result in a, cow, a cranial flap of the scrotum and a caudal flap of the scrotum. Now, where does the Newberry knife come in? The Newberry knife can make that the two incisions at the same time. How? You puncture the lateral wall, for example, of the right one. Okay? Right? You place it in the middle of the scrotum. <laughs> Pack! <laughs> right? Th this blade here, you place it in the middle of the scrotum and then pull down. Okay, you pull down. That will make those two incisions. Right? And then you simply remove the testicles the same way. Okay? Why, why is there this method? Because for some, they don't have another person that will restrain the animal. Or for some, this is a bigger, you know, bigger animal. And this could be you know, easily utilized by one person. Because the patient would be in the shoot. All they do is just one, one knife incision down and then... You know, legate the testicles, remove. That's it. And then you leave the wound open for it to heal via secondary intention. Okay? So, again, one method that is available. Now, going into the bloodless uh, processes for castration, we have the illustrator bands. We have discussed this in the instruments. This is the simplest and most common method used by farm workers. Again, you do not need any anesthesia for it. You just need this apparatus wherein you are placing a ring, a very heavy, duty, small rubber ring, right? Around the uh, spermatic cord, around the neck of the scrotum, because you cannot see the spermatic cord basically. Okay? And that's why you use the illustrator device. Why do you need the illustrator device? The ring, the rubber ring that you're using is so small. It's like it's like the diameter of a ring. Okay? So, it's very hard to stretch it. That's why you have the illustrator bands. Okay? Now, you have to make sure that the entire scrotum, including the two testicles, must be included within the band. And the penis, which is sometimes uh, uh, not associated, um, kadiket around that area, um, you, have, you cannot. <laughs> okay? uh, the, you have to make sure that it is not trapped within the band. 
Okay, so what happens is that the entire scrotal sac and the testicles will become ischemic because you have occluded the blood supply. They will die and drop off within two weeks. Okay, the thing is with this one, they have found that the risk of tetanus in this method is increased. Okay, now you could, um, when you castrate calves in, with illustrator bands, you have to, uh, sorry, uh, that's not recommended but for calves when you castrate them in any way the way that you um uh, restrain them is in lateral recumbency na nakataas yung uh, upper limb okay yung limb na nasa taas basically yung nasa proximal side na once it's in lateral recumbency uh ililift mo yon okay so again you need more people All right so in, with lambs and kids you can actually lift them with their hind limbs like this right uh, showing the, the the scrotum right there and since this is quite this is a very fast um what do you call this a method or a procedure right let's Oh, shit. And band them. Now, you can do this operation by yourself, but it does help to have a helper. And anybody can really do the part that Justin here is doing. I have a 12-year-old son that helps me out at my house. So what we're going to do now is Justin's got it hit up, up here. We're going to uh, uh, place the band on. We have to point the elastrator with the points towards the body of the goat. So we're going to raise, uh, open the band, place it over the scrotum. Now we're gonna grab the tip of the scrotum and pull it through the rubber band. As we do, notice one testicle comes in. Oop, the goat kicks. That's okay, we can do it again. We pull it through one and both testicles there have popped in to that band. Now that's the big key to this is making sure that both testicles have, have uh, come through that rubber band. We count one and two. Once we're there, we go up here and we don't wanna put the band right up next to the body cavity, but just slightly below it. We put there, make sure that the teats that the male goat has is not in the band. We release the ba the lastrator, letting the band, uh, rubber band go tight. Then we pull the band, uh, lastrator off the band, and there we go. The the goat has been banded. Now that band will stay on, and, and it's going to. It's right now started to cut the blood supply off to the testicles. Blood can flow in, but it can't fl flow back out. So in about two to three, and band them. <laughs> now you can do this operation I by yourself, but it does help. To have ben a helper <laughs> and anybody can really do the part that justin here is doing i have a 12 year old son that helps me out at my house <laughs> all right Bordizo. this is what i've seen uh done in actuality okay i did we castrate a goat when i was in college did we i don't remember that i know i remember with this budded yeah i remember we actually even did acupuncture on a goat we did ruminotomy on a goat. Huh, did we castrate? Probably, maybe. I'm not the surgeon there because I'm the surgeon for ruminotomy. Uh, but anyway, this is what I see most commonly done. Right? The thing is with Bordizo, there is this risk. If you do not do it properly, that you think your, your animal is castrated, but it's not. Okay? Because how, is, how does this happen? You're basically just crushing... Right, crushing the spermatic cord in uh, certain sites, right? in certain specific parts of the spermatic cord. Okay? You're crushing it uh, for a period of time, which we'll discuss in a bit, and then that's it. Okay. And uh, what do you call this? Um, when you uh, when you crush the blood supply, that will basically just kill the testicle. Right. So how do we do this? This is how you restrain them. Basically, uh, paupoin mo yung uh, lamb or kid, and then pull the hind limbs up, right? Like that. And the other person would be palpating for, but for the spermatic cord of each testicle. The Bordizo process uh, can be used only once the spermatic cord can be palpated. And that can usually be palpated at uh, a month amount of age right or older of course okay so once you have identified the spermatic cord you now have to choose the size of the bordizo clamp okay this is the bordizo clamp uh in some uh references that is termed as a emasculatome as well okay because the the jaws of the bordizo clamp should fit the entire spermatic cord 
Okay? Now, now, you pinch the cord laterally. Basically, you're displacing the spermatic cord. This one. Laterally to the outside edge of the scrotum. Kailangan dikit na dikit siya dun sa scrotal skin. And then what you do is that you place the jaws, you open the jaws of the bordizo, okay? Uh, you place it on top of that, you know, the spermatic cord that you can palpate. You choose which one first, the left or the right, okay? And then you place it usually above the testicle, around 1 to 1.5 centimeters in distance, okay? And then you close the clamp, you keep it closed for 10 seconds, right, to crush the artery. Some would even, depending on the size of the spermatic cord and depending on the age of the animal, which you would expect as the animal gets older, the testis grows bigger and the spermatic cord grows thicker, right? So it entirely depends. It's not na tipong 10 seconds, tanggalin na yan. For some, they have done it 30 seconds, uh, 40 seconds, just to be sure, all right? So, uh, while you're doing this, since ayaw mong maklamp naman yung daliri mo, di ba? <laughs> right? You make sure that the spermatic cord is not slipping during this process. So, uh, left hand or right hand, if you're um, right-handed, you're, uh, you're, basically, your dominant hand should be the one um, handling the clamp. Okay? So, your non-dominant hand should be the one palpating for the spermatic cord. Okay? So if I'm right-handed, my right hand will handle the clamp. My left hand will handle the spermatic cord. Okay? Now, the entire time... Um, oh, sorry. Before you use the bordizo clamp pala, you have to make sure that the jaws are parallel to each other, that they can really clamp. Okay? They can close uniformly the entire width of the jaws in that same pressure. And when you actually store the bordizo, you have to keep it slightly open when not in use. Okay? Just some instrument trivia, right? Now, you do not need to clamp too much of the scrotum. Again, you're doing the bordizo clamping per side. Okay? You don't do it na sabay yun left and right. Okay? You choose one side first. And that is why you also displace the spermatic cord to the outward, most outward side of the scrotum. Para yun lang yung kailangan mo clamp Okay? Now, since this can take around 10 seconds or 30 seconds, it depends. The person handling the animal should be in a comfortable position and should be uh, sure of their restraint uh, of the animal the entire time. Okay? Now, you release the bordizo. Okay, you can assess that area and you clamp the spermatic cord, the other side. Um, it should be staggered, basically. Hindi siya dapat pantay dun sa level ng pagkaklamp mo dun sa kabila. Okay, that's usually around one centimeter below the first side. Okay, why? There are some uh, complications and risks associated na kapag same yung area ng pag-crush sa artery. Because this is the same way as the illustrator band and um, yung tinatalian lang ng rubber band. Isang level lang. They say, uh, what do you call this? Um, with the bordizo, you have to make sure that the site where you crush them are staggered. You could look at the, the call this, the image on the previous slide. Dapat ganun lang ilaba. Okay? And you also have to keep the distance from the testicle. Again, keep it closed for 10 seconds and then release. Okay? Now you can see the areas where it was occluded. And then uh, these areas will just slow off. They die, will slow off. Um, some complications would be testicular survival, which is the most common complication. Uh, severe scrotal swelling. You would expect that the scrotum would swell after this. That is why there is still some... Uh, issues about tetanus around this area, around this uh, procedure. So you also have to make sure that one of the core uh, vaccines for these animals are, is the tetanus uh, toxoid. Did I get it right? Yeah. Okay. So after castration, animals should be observed for abnormalities such as excessive swelling, hemorrhage, and signs of infections. Okay. And usually these... Um, these complications increase as the animals age. Kumbaga, uh, when older animals are castrated, uh, mas mataas yung risk of complications. 
Okay? Um, if you have you have done this procedure in you know not the best sterile area, which is common in farm animals, you have to give antibiotics for these patients at usually around five to seven days. Um, yeah. You could also give pre-surgical antibiotics, no? And you could continue that post-surgically. And don't forget to give NSAIDs, okay? Just be wary about the withholding of the meat or the milk, okay? So, next. Oh, this is just the dough of the birdie, so. So you take the, the testicles and you push the cord over to the side and avoid his nipple and you continue to hold the cord to the side so that it can't slip away. And when you have it in the right spot, you two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that side's done. I know, it still hurts, doesn't it? Oh, poor baby. And you come over to the other side. So you take the, the testicles and you push the cord over to the side and avoid his nipple and you continue to hold the cord to the side so that it can't slip away. And when you have it in the right spot, you two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that side's done. I know, it still hurts, doesn't it? Oh, poor baby. And you come over to the other side. You make sure that it's pushed over to the side. So you take the, the testicles and you push the cord over to the side and avoid his nipple. And you continue to hold the cord to the side so that it can't slip away. And when you have it in the right spot, you three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that side's done. My balls. Oh, hurts, doesn't it? Oh, poor baby. You didn't give me an old shirt. the other side. Okay. You make sure that it's pushed over to the side so it can't slip out, and you miss his, his nipple. And then the thing holds still like that. And he's done. Oh. No blood. It's, it's quite painful for him, so I like to give him a little... It's so cute, Azor. It's so cute. Few hours is when he's gonna be yeah, they gave Metacam. And it has, um, yep. it comes with a little syringe so you can get the right measurement. I think this is a go. pet goat. <laughs> Alright. That's it. Yep, so... Uh, that is it for um, this le an entire lecture video. Thank you for listening. Apologize. I apologize for the venting and ranting, which I always do anyway for the lecture videos. It's just you know a certain amount of time where you know you're gonna expect. Oh, when is the time that she's gonna vent? <laughs> All right. But I do hope you remain healthy. You keep yourself cool. I know it's it's hot out there. And there's like uh, brownout like shutdowns and all that. But yeah, um, yeah, be safe, keep strong, and don't put too much pressure on yourself, man. You know, uh, life is short, I guess. <laughs> life is short, you know, don't, don't stress too much. All right? Thank you, guys. And I will let you know about... I'll give you the link for the exam, which is... This is the only coverage for it and there is a reading assignment on equine castration and a cesarean section all right thank you all and be well bye bye so what we're going to do now is justin's got it hit up here we're going to uh, uh, place the band on we have to point the lastrator with the points towards the body of the goat so we're going to raise uh, open the band place it over the scrotum. Now we're going to grab the tip of the scrotum and pull it through the rubber band. As we do, notice one testicle comes in. Oop, the goat kicks. That's okay. We can do it again. We pull it through one, and both testicles there have popped in to that band. Now that's the big key to this, is making sure that both testicles have, have uh, come through that rubber band. We count one and two. 
Once we're there, we go up here and we don't want to put the band right up next to the body cavity, but just slightly below it. We put there, make sure that the teats that the male goat has is not in the band. We release the, ba the lastrator, let the band, uh, rubber band go tight. Then we pull the band, uh, lastrator off the band and there we go. Oh. The, the goat has been banded. Now that band will stay on and, and it's going to, it's right now started to cut the blood supply off to the testicles. Blood can flow in, but it can't fl flow back out. So in about two to three. Uh, not really. <laughs> All right. See, guys, are you still okay? Yeah. Imagination is the limit. Attachment of the horn to the corneal process of the frontal bone. Okay. You undermine the skin there and then you suture. There, you will have a skin flap around this area. Right. And that you will suture that over the wound. Okay. And they say that. You know, some or that. Alright, so that is it for the horning and the budding. I will go straight to uh, the castration.